this is the science show with Dr. Dada. It's just so nice, you cannot do without. This is the science show with Dr. Dada. It's just so nice, you cannot do without. Well, hello, 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 and welcome to another exhilarating episode of the Science Show with Dr. Dada on Jambo Radio Scotland. And as usual, we're broadcasting from the vibrant heart of the city of Glasgow. Now, today we're going to be, as usual, plunging into the happenings within the science world, and we're going to be looking at news items from all over the world. Of course, today we're going to be focusing more on these news highlights as we don't have a guest with us. But that's a good thing because that will give us more time to really bring to you what's happening all around the globe. Now, on today's show, we'll be delving into a thought-provoking topic. Could consciousness exist at the speed of light? Now, we know the speed of light is something that's very, very interesting in science, very fascinating. The fact that there's a cosmic speed limit, a speed beyond which nothing can travel. Um, and the question is, if you're traveling at the speed of light, is it possible that you could be conscious? So this is a very intriguing question that we hope to at least uh, look into a little bit today. Well, I'm your host, Dr. Adetu Mishidada, and I'd like to just remind you to tune in to us um, on uh, YouTube live uh, on DAB. And of course, you can uh, check us out at jamboradio.co.uk. We also encourage you to subscribe to the Jambo Radio Scotland channel on YouTube so that you can catch up on those uh, previous episodes as well. Very good. So, what are we going to be enjoying today then? We'll be covering some science news highlights. As said before, that will be an extended version of science news highlights. And again, we'll have the opportunity to join in the discussion. So the phone lines will be open and the number to dial will be 0141 so that will be open after the first round of science news highlights. So we'll be looking forward to hearing your contribution to the show. Now, on the science news highlights, there'll be a couple of parts. So the first part will be talking about cosmic news. So we're going to be looking at the uh, happenings around the world with the solar eclipse. And we'll also be talking about nuclear clocks. Then in the second part, we will be talking about the effect of microplastics on public health. So there's some new research results on that that I'm sure you'll find very interesting to, to consider. And then, of course, in the discussion of our question for the week, we'll be talking about could consciousness exist at the speed of light? And again, you'll be glad to know that our STEM song of the week is back. So we're going to be having a song of the week today so that's something that you can look forward to in fact you could say there's at least two songs of the week stem songs of the week one of them will be about the solar eclipse so that's a spoiler for you but the other one is going to be a surprise so if you stick with us to the end of the show you'll get to to hear it so don't go anywhere and keep that dial locked right here so now let's dive in into our show just a quick introduction for those of us, perhaps, who are new to this show, who haven't really been with us for a long time. Well, this show, as you know, is a STEM-focused show, STEM standing for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics. And what we try to do is to communicate science results from within Glasgow, from Scotland, and from other parts of the world. And the hope is to do that in a way that is engaging, that is entertaining, and in a way that we can all understand and appreciate. So that's our goal for the show. And that's what we hope to do today. That's what we do on every episode of this show. So now with that, we'll start with our science news highlights. So the first part of it. We have a, a few headlines from all over the world. The first one is about the solar eclipse. As we know, there was a solar eclipse in uh well mostly visible from the u.s uh on the 8th of april uh this year and it was a really really beautiful spectacle a lot of uh, pictures 
uh, surfacing on the internet, all over social media, about just how beautiful the views were um, of the solar eclipse. But I just like to highlight this um, this topic from Science News. It's just a, presenting a map of the next fifteen solar eclipses. So the next fifteen total solar eclipses, as can be viewed from you know different points on the Earth, and this is a, a really beautiful thing because it allows you to to plan if you'd like to maybe travel to where the solar eclipses can be seen you can uh, plan your your journey and and get to witness the beautiful cosmic spectacle now the science news has unveiled this sort of interactive map so this map is in fact what you could call a masterpiece of astronomical prediction because it basically showcases the the path of the next 15 solar eclipses and that takes us from now until 2044. now this guide is not merely a tool but what you could call the passport to the future because it's a, a really nice tool for planning your eclipse chasing adventures if you like um and just uh, breaking down a little bit about uh, the solar eclipses what really are they well a lot of people think perhaps solar eclipses are just random events that happen uh, maybe once in a lifetime actually it turns out that they are not unpredictable uh, as, as can be seen from this tool they follow a cycle just like our days and years and seasons follow a cycle the solar eclipses also follow a cycle that's called the Saros cycle. Now, this cycle has approximately a period of uh, 18 years, 11 days and 8 hours. And it's directed by the moon's orbit around the Earth. Now, this uh, orbit around the Earth, as we know, is not in the pl same plane as the, the orbit of the, the Earth around the Sun. And so that means that a lot of the time, the shadow of the moon misses the earth. And so there's no eclipse. And you only get an eclipse when the shadow of the moon lands somewhere on earth. Now, the path of the totality for these eclipses, that is where the moon completely obscures the sun, that reveals a band across the surface of the earth. And that is a really nice thing when you you happen to be in the location where you have this totality this this complete shadow of the moon it's really a, a beautiful thing to behold and um in my life i think so far i've seen only one eclipse it wasn't a total eclipse i remember it was a time when i was uh back in nigeria in lagos and there was this beautiful uh, solar eclipse. It was really, really breathtaking. Um, it's something beautiful. If you've seen it, you, you'll know what I mean. Um, and uh, of course, in the uh, in the tool that's been um, talked about here, where you can see the next 15 solar eclipses, and if we see if we have the picture up there. If you're watching on video, perhaps you'll you'll be able to see that as well. You'll see that in some parts of the world. Um, they, they actually get a lot of eclipses over the next 15 years and one of such places is australia now you could say when it comes to solar eclipses australia is really blessed over the next uh, 15 years uh, you see so many lines uh, crossing uh, australia um, america is not so bad you can see a couple of lines so they have uh, another couple of uh, eclipses to witness um, nigeria is going to get some i think um, over the next uh, 15 years, uh, we see some through uh, South America, um, but the UK doesn't seem to have any. <laughs> so over the next 15 years, so it's really just good to know. Um, so the Australia uh, hits the jackpot in 2028, 2030, 2037, and 2038. So maybe that's something you want to keep in mind if you. You'd like to chase that to to, to travel to australia uh, during those years to witness the eclipses very good so the uh allure of 
you could say the totality so the total eclipse is something that's really unmatched um, it's really just beautiful to see how the day transforms completely into into night and suddenly you have this beautiful uh, view of the sunset all around you you know normally sunset is in the directions kind of opposing the the setting of the sun um, uh, so that beautiful change in color of the sky from blue to orange you see that in the the other side of, of the setting of the sun but in the case of a, an eclipse you actually see that all around the horizon and it's a really really beautiful thing to see as we'll see in another item in the news there's something else that the eclipse another effect that it creates uh, as we'll we'll see well more on eclipses let's move on to the next headline now the next headline is another you know cosmic news item and it talks about the largest 3d map of the universe now the largest 3d map of the universe if you think about that it just means you know how you've got your google maps where you can electronically visit a place you can drop your avatar in and zoom in and go you know around in the streets and zoom out and so on so you have something similar to that but not for a city not for a country or a street but for the universe so this 3d map is really really an amazing uh, thing as well also reported on science news now in this uh, what you could call a groundbreaking achievement astronomers have actually constructed the largest 3d map of the universe and it opens new doors to understanding the enigmatic phenomenon and force of dark energy now this map is being is in a product of the dark energy spectroscopic spectroscopic instrument or desi so d-e-s-i and it spans millions of galaxies and quasars and it allows you if you're a researcher to explore the evolution of the universe and the mysterious dark energy that accelerates the expansion of the universe now we know dark energy is something that's been a very hot topic of research and uh, debates among among scientists amongst astrono astronomers as well and it constitutes a significant portion of the universe's total energy and it's something that's very puzzling to scientists because of its role in this you know this idea that the universe is expanding and recently there's been some discoveries as well regarding the the you know some discrepancies between um, different results on the speed with, at which the universe is expanding so this new map uh, by desi which catalogs the locations of about 6.4 million galaxies and quasars allows scientists to now trace the universe's expansion history across different epochs and this dates as far back as 11 billion years and so by analyzing these cosmic structures uh, the distribution that they have and so on researchers can now study um, things like baryon acoustic oscillations sound waves from the early universe that left imprints on the distribution of matter and so on and so forth now the data from desi uh, analyzed alongside observations from supernovae and so on will offer tantalizing hints into the secrets of dark energy and how things might evolve so the, although the you know these results are not definitive it just marks an exciting development in cosmology which s suggests a more complex narrative of the universe's expansion than previously thought good now let's move on to uh, another item in our news another headline and this is about nuclear clocks now clocks are another fascinating aspect of physics um, and this particular news item says that physicists have made a major step toward making a nuclear clock and the result is published in physical review letters so in a first tabletop laser uh, has nudged a thorium nucleus into a higher energy state 
what this means is that you can now use the the timing of the the oscillations of this uh, nucleus to build a clock and that's what has been published in physical review letters recently now this is you could, what you could describe as being on the brink of a revolutionary advance in timekeeping now this development of the nuclear clock uh, potentially surpasses the most accurate atomic clocks available today and you could ask well which one is the most accurate atomic clock available well, the record for the most precise atomic clock is held by the strontium clock that was built by Ye's group, and that was three years ago. And when I say Ye, I don't mean Kanye West, I mean Jun Ye, and that's a scientist at JLIA, JILA rather, uh, that's the Joint Institute of the University of Colorado Boulder and the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Now, of course, the most advanced atomic clocks don't just tell us what time it is. They could soon get so ludicrously accurate that they could be used for detecting things like gravitational waves and even testing the limits of relativity. So this new clock, this new development when it comes to uh, the nuclear clock is dependent on the precise control of thorium-229 thorium energy and it paves the way for you know building a clock based on that. So that's something you can read more about uh, both at Physical Review Letters and through Science News. Excellent. Now let's consider another headline um, so this is another one about the solar eclipse. So the, there's a phenomenon when, that happens when there's a solar eclipse and that's the fact that colors look slightly different uh, during an eclipse. I certainly noticed that um, back then uh, during the eclipse in Nigeria. But there's an effect that actually is responsible for this. There's a science, the science behind that. Now during a to total solar eclipse, uh, what you see is that there is a dramatic shift in the appearance of colors around you. Now, this phenomenon uh, where the colors seem to pop or change their hue can be attributed to a combination of atmospheric conditions, the unique characteristics of sunlight, and the physiological uh, responses of the human eye to changes in light intensity. Now, the factors there are a few factors. So a breakdown of these factors. Um, so when we talk about the atmospheric conditions and sunlight, uh, it's good to remember that sunlight is not just one color, right? Although it looks white to us, the, uh, the light actually consists of a, a broad spectrum of colors. And that's why precisely why it is white. It looks white. And so under normal circumstances, um, so blue light, which have the shorter wavelengths scatter more as they pass through the Earth's atmosphere. And that's why we see the blue sky, right? Meanwhile, the red light, the red light waves, they have longer wavelengths. And so they tend to travel more directly and are more likely to reach the ground. And that's what enhances the red colors in objects that are bathed in direct sunlight. And so during a total solar eclipse, what happens is that the, as the moon blocks the direct sunlight, the light that does reach the ground is mostly indirect. And so that means that it's more easily scattered and it's, it looks more blue. And so it means the objects that we see will reflect more blue light. And it's really, really bizarre when, when you actually witness this. It looks really, really surreal. Um, it's another effect uh, that you you enjoy when you witness a solar eclipse. Now, this effect is called the Purkinje effect. Now, this is basically just a shift in the perception of or perception of color during an eclipse. Great. So, before, thank you very much. Before our music break, we'll just take one more headline, and it's about. Uh, someone that's been dubbed the Protein Whisperer and her name is Oluwatoyin Ashojo 
and you can read about her in science news so she's known as the protein whisperer and she's dedicated her career to combating neglected diseases such as the hookworm and this is a parasite that she first encountered while volunteering at an orphanage in nigeria as a child with a unique expertise in determining protein structures she has significantly contributed to developing vaccines against diseases that dispropor disproportionately affect some of the world's poorest regions. So she's being celebrated for, for these achievements. Additionally, she is committed to fostering diversity in science, mentoring students from historically underrepresented groups, and enhancing educational programs at institutions like Dartmouth Cancer Center, where she now works. So you can read more about that story on science news as well very good so now we're going to take a music break and since it is quite a rainy day today uh, in glasgow we're going to listen to a song by lady black lady smith black mabazo that's a group and the title of the song is rain rain beautiful rain and we'll be right back beautiful rain. fantastic that's a beautiful one, isn't it? Really love the a cappella in that song. And the lyrics too. The really, really beautiful lyrics. Rain, 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 beautiful rain. And it also talks about when the sun says good night to the mountain. Very much in, in line and in tune with what we've been talking about. And of course, that's making a reference to sunsets, uh, the beautiful colors that uh, accompany sunsets and so on and so forth. And of course, we've talked about some of the science behind that already. Great. So we'll move on now to the second part of our, our science news highlights. And again, just taking the opportunity to shout out to our sponsor, IOP Scotland and the University of Glasgow. And also to remind you that you can, of course, listen to the show on DAB. And you can listen and watch us live at jamboradio.co.uk and also on various social media platforms. Good. So, let's get on to our sixth headline now. So, this is something that, you know, affects most of us. A new study has linked micro microplastics to heart attacks and strokes. Now, here's what we know. A recent pub, uh, study published in the New England Journal of Medicine has linked microplastics found in artery clogging plaques to a significantly increased risk of heart attack, stroke, or death. And this, of course, raises global concerns about plastics' impact on human health. Now, this study adds to the growing body of evidence suggesting the presence of micro and nanoplastics in human tissues, but does not conclusively prove harm. Uh, the findings underscore the urgent need for further research into the health effects of microplastics and for actions to reduce plastic pollution. So perhaps this is something you've heard a lot about before. Microplastics here, microplastics there. Well, microplastics are tiny plastic uh, particles, usually less than 5 millimeters in size, and they often originate from the breakdown of larger plastic items due to environmental factors. Now, these tiny particles of plastic somehow make their way into drinking water, into, you know, other foods as well. And they come from a variety of sources like cosmetics, clothing and plastic waste. Now, the sad news is that these microplastics have infiltrated eco uh, ecosystems worldwide and they affect wildlife uh, very badly, as we know, and now also humans so something needs to be done of course to reduce microplastic pollution and that will involve minimizing plastic use recycling and also supporting policies for environmental protection now what do you need to do personally what can i do to protect myself perhaps from uh, the effect of these microplastics well bo boiling water has been shown to significantly reduce the presence of microplastics in water and research indicates that this process can actually eliminate at least 80 percent of 
these contaminants. So this is basically a simple yet effective method for individuals to decrease their intake of microplastics from drinking water. So boiling water, not a bad idea. If you want more details on that, you can uh, read an article about that from New Scientist's website. Very good. So next, let's uh, another thing that affects public health, and it says, and, and you know, has to do with water as well. It says, don't use unsterilized tap water to rinse your sinuses. So this is another news item from Science News. So don't use unsterilized tap water to rinse your sinus sinuses because it may carry brain-eating amoeba. <laughs> so that's a little bit scary, isn't it? It sounds a little bit scary. But it is uh, based on published research uh, from March 12, 2024. And it's published in a journal called Emerging Infe Infectious Diseases. And the title of the paper is, well, it's a bit of a mouthful, but we'll give it a go. Acanthamoeba amoeba infection and nasal rinsing. So that's from uh, Jay Haston and co-workers. Now, of course, what's this about? Well, we know sinus rinses often, you know, offers relief from uh, conge congestion. Uh, so when you have a cold, it's something that people tend to do quite often. But these studies show that that poses a risk when unsterilized tap water is used for the rinsing. And that potentially leads to infections from deadly amoebas like acanth amoeba and nigleria fowleri. Now, these uh, microorganisms are very deadly because they can infect the brain. And they, although they're rare, but serious cases often involve compromised immune systems. So it's advised to avoid risk to use distilled, sterile, or properly boiled water. It looks like that, that's a, a theme today as well. Uh, so boil your water, it gets rid of microplastics, but also get rid, gets rid of dangerous uh, microorganisms. Very good. So there's another news item that we'd like to highlight today, and it's to do with uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. So long COVID. So long COVID brain fog may be due to damaged blood vessels in the brain. So this is some, you know, the impact of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic is something that's been around for a long time and probably will be around for many, many years to come. And of course, one of the terms you hear, uh, you, you hear, hear from the pandemic is long COVID and brain fog that goes along with it. So long COVID brain fog. So that's a condition marked by memory and concentration problems persisting even after recovery from the acute phase of COVID-19. And this may be linked to a damaged uh, blood vessel or to damaged blood vessels in the brain. Now, this study offers new insights into the biological basis of, you know, the, the brain fog and hopefully potential treatment paths. Now, the leakiness of blood vessels in the brain is something obviously that is, is of concern and could be responsible for this brain fog. Now, the phenomenon was observed through MRI scans where a dye introduced into the bloodstream was found leaking into the brain, particularly pooling in regions of the brain responsible for language, memory, mood, and vision. Now, this indicates uh, a breach in the blood-brain barrier and of course this is a tightening a tightly knit layer of cells lining the blood vessels in the brain and that act as a bouncer to prevent harmful substances from entering the brain so of course if there's a breach there caused by the effect of the uh, you know covid infection then that uh, would explain some of the symptoms some of the uh, cognitive sim symptoms now the effects of covid 19 on the brain of course, as we've seen, also uh, as seen in this uh, report, is something that extends beyond the immediate uh, symptoms. It seems the disease 
is uh, has been associated with a range of neurological and mental health issues including de depression anxiety and a significantly higher risk of stroke in severe cases so you can read more about this story from science news and also you can read from uh, more about it from covid19.nih.gov so covid19 dot nih.gov very good another news item on covid19 is uh, talking about why it is not seasonal so far so unlike other respiratory viruses the the way that covid19 actually uh, manifests itself and how is in particular how it hasn't become seasonal is something that has um you know, intrigued scientists, and it is a multifaceted and interesting problem. Now, a piece of news from Science News delves into this this topic, and it highlights that while factors like weather conditions that are, affect the stability of a virus uh, and, and other conditions um, are the case for other viruses, the spread of COVID-19 is more influenced by human behavior and immunity levels. So that's something else that marks COVID-19 as separate and different from other uh, flu viruses. Very good. So that's something else you can read about from Science News. So now we've come to the second music break. And here we're going to listen to what we like to call a STEM song. It's about the solar eclipse. So we'll listen to it. It's entitled Solar Eclipse. And afterwards, we'll talk about what we hear in the lyrics. Yeah, it's the science show with Dr. Dada. April 8, 2024. A date with the cosmos meets galore. From north to south, the crowds will pour to witness the sun tonight and so much more. Moon shadows cross from shore to shore. A dust of light, nature score. The sun and moon in a silent war. A moment passed in time, heart sore. In the path of totality we explore. A phenomenon never seen before. With eyes to the sky, spirits soar. April 8th, a day we can't ignore. In the cosmic game, we're keeping score. As daylight fades, our hopes will soar. An eclipse is torch, the sun's a core. April 8, 2024, forevermore. Yeah, that's that's a, a very interesting one. You'll notice there um, in the lyrics a few things that kind of talk about the science behind the eclipses, don't they? So April 8, 2024, of course, that's the just uh, uh, past uh, solar eclipse that was visible from the US. That's referring to that. And it talks about a date with the cosmos. Um, just referring to the fact that when whenever you experience an eclipse when you you see an eclipse it just reminds you of your place in the universe it reminds you of the way things really are you know it gives you perspective and uh, you've got the sun and the moon revolving around the earth and the shadow of the moon on the earth and being in that shadow is just a really beautiful thing and a breathtaking thing, thing to experience and then it says crowds will pour. Of course, a lot of people uh, went uh, to the path of totality to try to witness the eclipse. Uh, it was a really beautiful thing indeed. And it also talks about the moon's shadows cross from shore to shore, a dance of light, nature's core, the sun and moon in a silent war. I really like that line. It's a silent war. It's like the moon and the sun i remember when we were growing up um they used to describe the eclipse as the sun and the moon fighting so you've got the sun and the moon and it looks like they're going to collide and then the moon blocks the sun and so on so that's kind of referring alluding to that and then a moment post in time and so on and so forth so that's our attempt at uh the stem wrap of the week uh on this week's edition of the show 
good there's more to come there's more music to come so do stay with us so now let's have a discussion of the question of the week so question of the week it was the question was could consciousness exist at the speed of light could consciousness exist at the speed of light so to to deal with this question there are a few things we need to consider number one what is the speed of light well we know that as we mentioned earlier as well uh, that the speed of light is the ultimate speed limit in the universe it clocks about 299,792 kilometers per second in a vacuum now nothing in the universe is known to travel faster than the speed of light there are some theoretical objects called tachyons but we'll, maybe that's the subject of, of another show so nothing is known to travel fata- faster than the speed of light the next question is can we actually reach the speed of light is it possible to reach the speed of light well the simple answer according to einstein's theory of relativity only massless particles like photons and that those are just referring to light basically uh, you know only photons can travel at the speed of light very good then the next question is what happens to matter as it approaches the speed of light assuming you have this hypothetical jet or car or whatever uh, or spaceship and it travels so fast that it starts to approach the speed of light what happens at that point well again uh, the, the physics says that as matter speeds up close to the speed of light the mass changes you know the faster it goes the, the heavier it becomes and it gets to a point where the mass becomes infinite pr- pretty much as it approaches the speed of light and it would require infinite amount of energy to move it at that speed to accelerate it to that speed and so that practically makes it impossible because there's n- you know nobody has an infinite amount of energy um so how does consciousness fit into into this then well of course the way we understand consciousness is the state of being aware being able to think about your existence about your experiences i I would like to add and it's a subject that's more often explored in philosophy and in psychology now some physicists and neuroscientists are trying to probe the connections between consciousness and physics and the physical world of course now so the question then is could consciousness exist independent of physics well since that's outside physics we probably won't give a definite uh, a definitive answer to that one but most theories suggest that consciousness arises from complex brain functions at least in the physical realm and whether it can exist independently of matter or at the speed of light is a question that challenges the boundaries of current scientific scientific understanding and my take on it is you know it's it's beyond physics um so we would we'll leave that quite that part of the of the discussion but then back to our question then assuming you can assume it was possible to accelerate your your, your rocket if you like to the speed of light how would how would that be what would you experience how would the experience feel like well i think the way i would like to approach that is to consider what time feels like um when you're traveling at the speed of light now based on einstein's uh general relativity time is something that undergoes what we call dilation when you travel really fast when you approach the speed of light and the result of that long story short is that when you're traveling that fast the fa- you know the faster you travel time basically contracts co- compresses into an instant so an eternity for a photon would compress to an instant so something that took maybe 10,000 years for a photon in the eyes of a photon that journey of a thousand years is like an instant so an example, for example, uh, it would be uh, a photon that's released from a star that's maybe 3,000 light years away. 
So to us, the you know, three thousand light years or three thousand years ago, the the photon gets away from the star and travels to us and takes three thousand years to reach us, right? However, from the point of view of the photon, because of the laws of relativity, the photon actually experiences that as an instant. So the, the photon is absorbed or arrives at Earth in the instant that it was born. It's a bit, a bit mind-bending. It's hard to, to imagine that, but that's exactly what the, the physics says. So the, the photon, to the photon, the time, one, one instant is basically an infinite amount of time. So time stops, if you like, for a photon. So if you traveled at the speed of light, that's what it would be like. So the way I like to think of that is if someone exists who doesn't, you know, the concept of time is completely lost because an eternity is like an instant, uh, then, you know, how would you define that in terms of what we understand as consciousness? Because consciousness is something that we understand to be something that requires a little bit of the ability to keep track of time, if you know what I mean. So in consciousness, I would argue that the perception of time is crucial because time allows for a sequence of thoughts, the progression of learning and the, you know, evolution of emotional responses. And these are all key, you know, concepts in consciousness, key components of consciousness. So. If you're, if you're in a situation where you can't actually, you know, everything is like an instant. Like the moment, from the moment you're born to the moment of death is basically an instant. Then to me, that sounds, doesn't sound like consciousness would be possible. It's, be, you know, consciousness requires a sequence of time um, from my point of view. So, you know, purely from that point of view, you could say, as far as we know, from our experience of what consciousness is, it would seem that consciousness would not be possible um, when you're traveling at the speed of light, assuming that were possible. So, so many things to unpack there, but yes, it, it, is, it is really mind-boggling and very fascinating indeed, and it's subject of ongoing research um, when it comes to consciousness, how that relates to physics and so on and so forth. So the ultimate question you could say is, given the relationship between time and consciousness, can we ever truly understand consciousness at the speed of light? Well, I guess that's a question for perhaps another time. So what we're going to do now is we are going to listen to a song we're going to take a break is by Whiskid. It's called Ojue Legba, and we'll be right back. Well, that was Ojue Legba by Whiskid. Really beautiful song, and uh, one of the the greats in the world of Afrobeats. And this is the Science Show with Doctor Dada on Jambo Radio Scotland, broadcasting live from Glasgow. So. I think it's time for us to enjoy the stem or what I'd call the second stem song. Um, so this song is actually, there's an inst interesting story be about this song. And we're going to talk about some science that's related to it as well. So that, that'll be fun. But this song is entitled Tenge Tengerere. Now, perhaps it's something that you've heard on social media, you know, in various posts. But this is a song that was popularized by the boy called Rango. And um, we're going to play it now, uh, a version of it that we've made specially um, on the show. And we're going to talk about why or what it means and if there's any science that we can take away from it. So let's listen to Tenge Tengerere. Dang it! Dang it! Dang 
Great, I hope you enjoyed that. Um, so, yes, you'd have heard maybe other versions of, of beats made to that song. Well, I said before, this song was popularized by the boy called Rango, and that's his voice in, in there. And when asked about what it means, um, what they said was that it's a song from Uganda that's sung to toddlers as they take their first steps. So it's a song that you use to encourage them and to tell them uh, they're doing well or to, to keep them going. So it, it's a, a song to motivate them to continue trying and describes their initial attempts at walking. So I think this is a really, really nice idea. And speaking of the science behind that, well, one key aspect of how toddlers uh, or how music affects toddlers is its influence on brain development. And this is backed by science. Um, music listening and playing have been associated with changes in the brain's auditory and prefrontal cortexes. And these are areas responsible for both speech and music. And this indicates a substantial overlap in the neural mechanisms underlying music and language processing suggesting that musical experiences could foster language development in very young children. And it's interesting, you know, in various cultures, of course, you have something similar where there are songs that are known in a particular culture that are being, you know, used to encourage children in certain activities. So in this case, in kind of, you know, taking their first steps. So there's, there's a story to that song and it's from uh, Ugandan culture, which is very, very interesting. And uh, if I want to say that in pidgin, how would that sound? Well, let's try all this. Um, my pidgin is not very strong, but pidgin English, I could say something like, scientists don't they look into how music they affect Peking, where still they grow, especially them where still they learn how to talk and walk. Actually, in real pidgin, you would say waka and yeah talk is uh, maybe talk talk works as well in pg i guess and he, and then recent tori with them research find out say music they very important for the way pekin brain they take they develop how them they feel how them they act and how them they even they move their body music they help pekin for many ways like to help them improve how they take the talk how then they feel, how then they take, remember things, how then they concentrate and even make their body strong and coordinated. Well, coordinated is not, <laughs> I don't know how to say that in pigeon, so I'll just go with the English word for now and so on and so forth. Perhaps in a future edition, we'll have a, a more um, lengthy pigeon aspect or version of the show. Anyway, that's a wrap on this week's exploration into the f fascinating world of science here on The Science Show. And whether you're an uh, enthusiast of science or you're just wanting to keep up with the latest happenings in the world of STEM, well, this is the place to be here on The Science Show with Dr. Dada on Jambo Radio Scotland. I would really like to hear from you as well, your questions, thoughts, or comments about today's show or other shows, please feel free to share them with us by emailing us info at jamboradio.co.uk or through our, you know, just a comment on our videos on social media and so on would be another nice way to do that as well. And I'd like to say a big thank you for tuning in to this week's edition and a thank you to our sponsors and the technical team behind the scenes. And this is the Science Show and Dr. Dada signing off until next time. Stay curious.